John Gable is the co founder and CEO of Allside Technology, offering balanced news, media bias ratings, diverse perspectives, and real conversations at scale. Allside provides patented technology, tools, and services to media. Sorry. So, sorry, tools and services to media companies, schools, nonprofits, and parks. John is a 30 year veteran of Microsoft and Netscape and a successful entrepreneur, helping shift the first version of Firefox and selling two startups. Before his technology career, John was a professional political campaigner and executive director. John is also fluent in Klingon, and Captain, if I may say so, you almost made me believe in luck. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming John Gable. Okay, well, you say you hear me. I got very good at sitting still. I cannot speak Klingon. Um, I we were joking because I'm a big Mr. Spock fan and say it's a very logical guy. Um yeah, it's really been fun. So thank you all. Thank you, Kevin. You've got me started on this crazy path here at UCR. And the stuff we're doing together at UCR is really is unique. And so I'll describe that a little bit to you, but we're really doing something that can have serious impacts in society longer term. And it's a pretty exciting thing. But let me go ahead and kick off a little bit and just kind of tell you, I thought I'd give you a little presentation that share with investors a little bit, which is going to be really high level and just talk about all sides a little bit. But in general, there is a moment in time right now. When I was at Netscape, the world was changing overnight. Um, it was kind of moving the same way, and the internet had to happen. And you all don't understand how different it was before that, but things changed change dramatically. Well, I wasn't good and I was so real. And that's happening right now as well with what's happening with social media, online technology, and the AI that's happening now. And it's really up to us to define what that path, what country will say, what that will mean. And what's happening here at UCR and us and literally 10,000 other emerging organizations and many other groups, we are defining a stronger path for our future than what we are doing. So this is kind of fun. It's cool stuff. I have fun stuff to show you. But it is also a great event. And so just keep that in mind. And it can be both. It can be fun and a very important for society. Okay. So just to have a little bit of fun. Oh, we're going to talk about this. I'm working, but I can do this.
Just by being angry with each other. Now that's kind of funny to something like, like Prince William uh, flipping somebody off. But it's very, very important when the issue is something different. Now, just to kind of get you where we are, how we got to this place where we could be so misled. I'm just going to give you a little personal history and then kind of show how that goes to where we're going. So 1997 was a big year for me. I, I joined Netscape. It, the internet browser, the first popular internet browser, already shipped. But I joined a little bit later, and it shipped another version. It's actually based on Mozilla Firefox. So y'all, y'all have heard of Mozilla Firefox, right? But you're too young to have ever heard of Netscape, right? Except for Kevin and I, everybody else has no idea. So that's like the first popular web browser. Before that, the internet wasn't something you could use for the most part. Um, and but we had this great training program. So with the internet, we could get information from all around the world and we could make better decisions. We'd be able to meet individuals across the world or across the country and know that there's individuals like we do on Zoom today. And a lot of us are working crazy hours for this world too, so we could make better decisions, build a better future. But that same year, I joined Netscape. I also had finished a book and gave a speech about the unintended consequence. This book, I, how many of you all know this book, Abusing Ourselves to Death? We, we have some geeks like me, awesome. Um, and essentially, what this describes is how the medium can drive the message. So the author was very worried that news moving from the written word to the TV world would go from being something rational and considered to sensational, emotional nonsense. We had one. And I thought about, okay, what does that mean when we actually, what will the internet do? And back in 97, I found the internet, the way information flows, which is similar to that and find that or the kind of stereotype. That we can train to discriminate against each other in new ways. We now talk about that in terms of filter models, in terms of tribalism. And that's not such a great thing. So where is that brought us? That maybe change something maybe last night to roll here again. Okay. So basically we have a worldwide crisis credit over. We don't know what we need anymore. We go online and we reach out, I don't know what's true. We're actually all sites with a video page right now that's being bad ones. They said something very different about us than just two weeks ago. It looks like a completely different company. And, um, and you're so overwhelmed by a peer group that believes in one thing, manipulated by this group, or popularity or clickbait. We just don't know what's going on. Anymore. And it's just driven by bias. It's driven by disinformation. It's driven by social religion. And all that's accelerated by algorithms, generative AI, and really toxic business models that give you more money for doing really bad things. And it's not an issue for this one area. It's full pollution for about everything. This is not just the US, it's worldwide. And it's impacting consumers, it's impacting news, it's impacting businesses, it's impacting schools, it's impacting our families, our daily lives, our workplaces. It's really threatening and ripping to shreds a part of our democratic society. So, what do we do about that? Well, in very short, very top level, we can discover the truth. Together. I'm not talking about an industry. I'm not talking about a place where this is the source you should trust. Because history shows that, that even if they're well meaning, they're wrong and wrong in the workplace, but they're being corrupt or very nice to sell to this data. It's not the other extreme. We see usually the arts and behavior for people. It's like either be administrators or just let it go for it. The problem with that. Is that the people with the most money, the most power, the most celebrity, the most clicks, the most whatever tend to overtake that system for their own benefits? And that works against them. And so the answer there is something a little different. And 
It's basically a balance system. It's just where we'll talk about policy. The analogy I is when you think about what's about dictatorships have problems, right? They are basically an administrator. They kind of decide everything, and they go wrong. They may be beneficial, but they may be less less confusing and less messy. But there are problems with that, like well, genocide, so like that's happening from it. And then you have the other street, which is kind of unfettered direct democracy, like early Athens, or uh, and generally what you have when you have direct democracy is sooner or later the republicans get scared and they vote in the power where they or it's actually great for witch tribes. Everybody's convinced that this person is a witch that's firm or you know, that's not that good either. So what you have is this democratic republic, which is what we have today. It's the right uh, amount of that's you want to write that amount. It's getting a little out of hand right now. You can continue to work on it. But it's actually the, the best solution, or maybe if you run the least fast. I think we need the same approach to dealing with disinformation and bias and, and understanding what the tax is going on. You're not going to have an actual. Here's the answer. Because the actual tax is not good for us. They're digital speaker. We need to be agents of our own future, decide for ourselves, for our own health, our own medicine, as opposed to being forced or think we have to be exactly like this year or believing whatever my favorite politician tells me we believe. That's unhealthy. And we see people in high school in particular increase their pressure and even suicide. People are young girls. This all goes together. And so it's a big issue. But this is what we get out of this discover the truth together. We do that through balanced information by giving people a different perspective so they can decide for themselves. And also, I'm on the cross divides. Turns out that we're not as smart as we can do. We don't make decisions to much. We make it emotionally through our friends, relationships, and then we use our big old brains to convince ourselves what genius is we were all wrong. That's really the only condition. Now we can work on that. We can. Have friends outside to keep this balance. We can betray ourselves. And that's generally the, the way that you can use safe decisions. So we need this balance. We need to challenge it and not just believe in what we believe. So, how do we do it? So, in all sciences, this is what we really get into with UCR and what we're doing together. Is. So, the first thing we do is we start with analysis. So, early days in all sciences, we came up with a patent system to break the bias of um, use. So and Henry a little later, so he's told us about how that works. Was because we use this as a way to identify different perspectives. But how many here have kept Heard of or understand the idea of cluster analysis? Oh, okay, okay. So the idea is let's say we ask you if you like fried chicken or not, or if you like fried chicken or more kind of chicken. And then you ask everybody, there are a bunch of people love fried chicken and every kind of fried chicken. There are other people who love, I'm from East Africa, and other people love um, baked chicken or they love rotisserie chicken or whatever. So there'll be natural groupings. Of the way people answer that question. So you imagine a 3D chart, and there'll be a whole bunch of group of people that have this belief, another group that have this, another group that have this. That's kind of cluster analysis. So you identify clusters of people, and therefore, oh, this group of people, they all kind of believe this one thing. Well, with the help of UCR and some technology we have, and even UCR and AI, the idea is we can put in any issue. And the technology can point out this is what everybody's saying about it. You're the natural clusters of opinions. And then we can even get to the point where you can say, aha, here are the top arguments for each of those opinions. And we can get that to everybody. And in a very short period of time, you can get a very good understanding of the issue across the differences and decide for yourself. That's what the analysis is doing. That's what we're really doing with UCL right now, is to develop that technology to make that possible. And then you use that technology to summarize things. So we, we have, at our side, we show you those center line articles in the same story, and even um, pretty much every story, not every story, but it's amazing how different the headlines can be from left center right. 
kind of loose source even it's something as simple as here's a job report for today for this month the way they cover a screw model that we do and see that you guys get a sense of that of what difference so we can summarize that and so these guys right here the word at least three up here they're working a lot on not just to enact where they store that world but then but about an issue in that so they can provide because the technology is quite there that the different perspectives on an individual issue so you can assign yourself and then we're not going to do as much of this today, but then we have ways for people to have time. Ian Nass, always broken in small groups of four to six diverse people. So through the system, we have the accident and discover the humanity of the other person. And then we can listen to each other and really challenge each other and decide. And that's pretty much what all science is about. And I, I should have had a last slide. This gets to the there is a crisis, it's just a big thing. And this is a very practical way to address that. I know it's very tempting to say, this is just happening. But when you talk to experts and academics about movements, movements that change society, movements where you actually have a change in culture, change in policy, they tell us that about, you only need about three and a half percent of people to get engaged in that idea. And what's the habit of society change? Um, also change, culture changes. There are three and three million Americans in the US. And three and a half percent is like five and a half million voters or ten and a half million adults. And as somebody who's worked at Netscape at Microsoft, those are very achievable markets. So you don't have to worry about the other 90% or people who just will never change. That's not necessary. We only have to engage in power that I know that wants to create a future, a better future. And you really have to decide here whether you want to be part of that creating a new future or not. So that's my speed. Um, but let me give you Henry and now I'll have to bring on your own and bring Henry in so we can take a so Henry, other one, you go ahead. Go ahead and bring yeah, just the mic test really quick. Hello. Oh, I'm sorry, Henry. I think we're experiencing some technical difficulties, so they're gonna give us a brief pause before we continue. That's fine. Hello? Okay, hang on. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Hi, Henry, and hello, everyone. My name is Matthew Doharo. I'm our Dean's Ambassador, and I will be the clicker for Henry. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Is it me? Hello? Can you say you can say yes. Go ahead, Henry. All right. Can can everyone hear me? Yes. Hello. Ask yes. us another chance to talk a little bit so we can get your volume higher. Go ahead and talk, Henry. Hello, can you hear me? Test one, two, three. Good? Good. Um, uh, can you all hear where I'm well enough? You want to keep listening? Give us a second, Henry. Sure. Okay. 
Okay, Henry, you want to go ahead and start try speaking? Yes. Hello. Uh, can they hear me? Can you all hear me? Yes, Henry, go ahead. Okay, we're good. Hi, everyone. Henry Brechter here, Editor-in-Chief of All Sides. I just want to th say thanks for being here tonight to, to hear us talk, but also to learn about the great work our team of, of students here at UCR is doing, Andrew, Divya, and uh, Samuel. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So, like John said, the All Sides Media Bias Ratings are kind of our core component, our core tool here at All Sides. Basically, these allow you or anyone to easily identify different perspectives so you can get the full picture of issues and think for yourself. We call these the most trustworthy media bias ratings on the web because we use a patented proprietary system and surveys to reflect the average judgment of Americans. So we'll, we'll uh, watch a video that explains those methodologies in detail in a minute, but basically they include things like surveys of our audience, thousands of people across the political spectrum, as well as editorial reviews conducted by our multi-partisan team of experts on the left, center, and right. And why do we do this? Well, because there's no such thing as unbiased news. Everyone has a bias and that's okay. But once there's hidden bias, once information providers act like bias doesn't exist, that's when it becomes a problem. That's when people get misled and manipulated and divided. And so those are the things we need to avoid. Go ahead to the next one. So you saw the chart that's there on the left, and that shows the top US uh, and some international news sources from left to right, but we also rate almost 2,000 sources now. So that's not all of it. Those are just the top ones. On the right side here, you see the uh, some of the balanced news feed. So this is a daily curation of the top stories that sources across the political spectrum are talking about and covering and analyzing. And we do a lot of news here, but also opinion pieces, analysis, fact checks, anything that has the world talking in various corners. Next slide. So here's that video I mentioned. It's only about 90 seconds and apologize in advance. The chart in the video is very old. The one you just saw is the, the most recent one. So keep that one in mind, but go ahead and play the video. Okay, so that's a bit about how we spot bias and how we let people know where bias is, but we also provide resources for people to spot bias themselves. So one of those great ones is our 16 different types of media bias guide that's linked here in the slideshow, but you can also go to allsides.com, go to our media bias section, and you'll find it there. And so that includes some of the types you see here, like spin words or slanted presentation, or up in the top right corner, you have an opinion statement presented as fact. These are all consistent types of bias we spot in media coverage across the spectrum. And laying it out in this way empowers news consumers to be able to spot it themselves and avoid being manipulated by these biases. 
always, we always emphasize the importance of reading multiple perspectives. And so that can avoid manipulation. And that's something that our great group of public policy students is going to tell you even more about and how they're putting that into practice with their work for all sides. And that's it. Take it away, guys. And thank you. It's already. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your time, Mr. Brechter. I know he needed again, but thank you again. Um, at this time, I'm delighted to welcome to the speakers table on stage our student spotlight presenters. Divya Bardwaj, Andrew Shannon, and Samuel Shroff, will you please take your seats on stage? Thank you all. Okay, our first student spotlight speaker is Divya Bardwaj. She's an undergraduate public policy major at UCR. As a research assistant for Allside, she works to create balanced information on issues such as GMOs, abortion, and gun control. To expose people to her, yes, clap. If you felt the yes. round of applause. To expose people to information and ideas from all sides of the political spectrum. She embraces her inner graphic designer by creating engaging media to publish alongside each article, whether that be posts for social media or a survey to collect feedback. One more round of applause for Divya, please. Our next spotlight speaker is Andrew Shannon. He's a second year standing public policy student focusing on policy institutions and processes and environmental policy. He is a committee member of the official podcast of the UCR School of Public Policy, Policy Chats. Andrew is on track to receive his bachelor's and master's degree at UCR. Andrew hopes to work in some form of government in the future as he has a passion for the sphere of politics. As an all side assistant, he gets to carry his love for politics through writing all stances, where he utilizes research and AI tools to delve into all the perspectives on political issues facing our country. We're happy to have you here, Andrew. One more round of applause for Andrew. And last but certainly not least, Samuel Schroff was born in Alton, Illinois, but has lived in Charlotte, Omaha, Fresno, and San Diego. So he truly has an all sides perspective of things. He is a sophomore studying at the UCR School of Public Policy with the goal of working as a legislative staffer, journalist, or lawyer. He is particularly interested in how partisan politics impacts the passage and implementation of U.S. policy and how citizens choose their representatives. He participated in mock congressional debate for four years during high school. Thank you for participating in today's talk, Samuel. One more talk. Well, without no more ado, Andrew, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Miriam. And it's truly a pleasure to be able to speak with you guys tonight. Perfect. Right, right slide. And to just kind of start off tonight, this is gonna be a theme that we're actually gonna, gonna discuss and talk about a lot, and it's filter bubbles. Um, we, we're pretty much all aware that we have our own individual filter bubbles, and I kind of like to think of this as the way that we individually interpret the world, right? The way we see things. However, at all sides, we focus on a little bit of a different type of filter bubble that Henry touched on a little bit, which is the media filter bubble. And that's anything that influences our opinions, our belief systems, right? To obviously podcasts, news sources, even friends and family, anything that contributes to the way that you interpret the world, right? And the first thing I think really relates to is confirmation bias. I'm gonna borrow one of John's phrases. We are confidently ignorant. We seek out information that reaffirms our pre-existing pre beliefs, right? You know, I flip on my favorite news source and it makes me happy that the information that they're sharing is the same thing that I think, and I share it in such a confident way. And I, I feel that I'm smarter than I'm a world known. However, you know, that kind of falls into a cognitive, cognitive fall uh, fallacy because I'm not world knowing and 
neither is you know, anybody in this room. So I almost like to really challenge people to try to break out of this media level, break out of the confirmation biases, and really try to read and understand all the perspectives that we provide. Secondly, you know, this is a little intuitive, but when we really focus on our media filter bubbles so much, we get isolated from new knowledge. We're only seeing a certain portion of an issue. And we're constantly looking, we're constantly talking to, and are constantly being exposed to the same type of information, right? There's no room for growth or anything like that. I just want to clarify something that, you know, breaking down filter bubbles and you know, being open minded, that does not mean completely changing your mind on all these different issues. There. What I mean is that you earnestly and honestly sit down with your, maybe your, idea, your ideological opposite. So when you tell that to disagree with you, and you really try to make their mind, you really try to understand where they are coming from and why they believe the certain things they do. That why part is very important, right? What evidence is intriguing to them? What statistics are they pointing to? Maybe like what background do they have that can cause them to maintain certain positions? That white part is so important. When we expose ourselves to information, especially you know, knowledge and information that differs from our own beliefs, we equip ourselves with the ability to have positive intellectual discourse. In turn, we create impactful changes in our society. Last but not least, expanding polarization. And this is something that John really touched on a lot. And you know, I'm, sure, I'm sure you hear all the time, history and political science experts always claim this is the most divided America has ever been politically and ideologically, which is true. I'm, I'm sure you guys maybe caught some of the presidential debates. You've seen you know, politicians talk all the time on news channels, whatever it be. They're constantly trying to manipulate narratives. They're always misconstruing some, um, some statistics, some numbers, some data to benefit their politics, right? And that's where misinformation and polarization really starts and, and spreads because some of them know that you know, their audience will hardly believe that what they're saying is true. While I'm not going to come up here and claim that I have a holistic solution to this problem, I do believe that if we collectively work on breaking down our own filter bubbles and media bubbles, we will make very positive change, not only on ourselves and understanding ourselves, but on the rest of society. Being able to have this idea of informed conversation, real conversation, and begin to make really impactful changes. Something else that's really important that we do, combating misinformation. Now, I have to preface this with, it's really important to understand that misinformation is kind of we have to be very careful before we simply label something as misinformation. Just because something's misinformation to you or to me, it doesn't mean it's misinformation to the rest of people. Now, why is this? We live in a society that has their own information, has their own facts on just about everything. Um, I'll go back to politics just a little bit because to me, it almost seems like politics were not arguing on the same set of facts that we used to. You know, one side has their own facts, the other side argues with their own facts. So how, how can we make real conversation possible? We would not argue on the, on the same set of facts, on the same set of objective truth. It's just not possible. So with that, one person's misinformation is another person's truth. Now, this is an extremely tricky problem to solve. And I think the point that I really want to make is, of course, objective truth is real, but we may need to hear more perspectives finally. Now, my next important bullet point here is that it's not the majority view, the popular view. Some people think that just because what most people believe, it has to be the correct view. And this can you know, sometimes be wrong. Just because a majority of people believe something doesn't obviously you know, make that opinion correct. And at all sides, you know, almost a solution to everything that we do is we provide the full spectrum of information. We want quality and source information to our readers with a plethora of perspectives. Now, this gets me to the, the, the kicker. This is the point that I want you guys to walk away with when you read, when you read our work. 
we want you to think for yourself. What do I mean by this? Too often, um, you know, sometimes we want to learn something from an issue and pull up our thumb. The first thing that we see on Google, that must be the truth, right? That, that must be what's factual. Maybe the second article on Google agrees with that, but the first article says it's true, right? It, it, it's 100% factual. And, or you, maybe we trust Jack GPT too much on our essays. Whatever Chat GPT came up with, that must be it. That's the answer. That's what my essay needs to be about. No, no, we truly, we need to take all the perspectives into consideration, look at all of them, and then being able to come up with an opinion, not just come up with an opinion, just to have one, being able to articulate it, why we have this opinion. And we do that by reading and understanding all the perspectives. Now, this is probably one of the most important slides of my life. It's how does all sides promote democracy? We hear this word all the time, democracy, and it is really fundamental to America. Um, if there's ever a day American democracy is dismantled, taken away, that would be the end, the beginning of the end of America. Right? So we really have to collectively work on this, and this is almost what everyone, all sides boils down to, is how do we really protect this democracy. And I don't know already mentioned some of these, but we're going to be looking at, at a lens of how do we, all right, again, protect our democracy. So first, thing, first things first, address some bias. I'm going to echo what John said. We're all biased. I'm biased. I'm sure all, all of us have bias. We all have bias from our lived experience, maybe the environment we grew up in, the education we received. It is not possible to escape bias. Bias is normal. Bias is okay. But that does not mean we should try to combat our bias. That does not mean we should work, not work to make our bias transparent. And the transparency of our bias is exactly what we do at all sides. Now, how do we do this? The first one is quite simple. We draw from a, by a wide variety of resources, a wide variety of different articles that have a lot of different biases across the political spectrum. And by using those articles, we create one comprehensive document, a comprehensive article that involves everything across the political spectrum of all those different types of biases, right? So by including all of those, we give you all the perspectives with all these different biases. The second way is that there's a lot of wonderful all-site staff that looks over our work that also individually they have a lot of different biases. So when all these different people are looking over our work, they make, they make sure that our work is not misconstruing one argument. Maybe it's not, we didn't leave out an argument, right? And the third way, it's probably the best way, is that you guys, the audience, gets to contribute in making sure that our bias is transparent. At the end of every article, we have a bias rating where you guys get to vote. Is it accurate? And things like that. And that's how we safeguard that. Or not, not really safeguard that, but we make our bias transparent. Second, probably one of the most important things too, the e-civil dialogue. I mentioned, you know, democracy is, is impossible if you don't have real conversation. A, a bird with one wing cannot fly. It, 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 cannot, it, it cannot succeed, right? We need differing views. We need, but not just, not just different views. We need people that are educated. Educated, this is probably one of the best ways you can partake in American democracy. And why is this so important? Especially for us. Workplaces, schools, families read our work. So it's not just we're putting information out on the internet just for the sake of doing it. So many people read our work. And what do we see? Like, what do we see your conversation happen? Because it happens all around us. It happens in grassroots movements. It happens at our family dinner tables. It happens even in something as formal as a Senate hearing. This is where it takes place. This is where progress is made. When we free ourselves from our filter bubbles, when we get exposed to new information, that has the potential to slightly change the way we see and, see and interpret the world, interact with others, we understand ourselves better, and again, we make impactful changes. The last thing I would like to touch on a little bit is false equivalency because I did speak on misinformation quite a bit. A false equivalency is a little bit of a big word, 
And what it is, it's a cognitive fallacy where you compare two things that have stark differences as if they are the same. I'm sure some of you heard the phrase, you know, it's like comparing apples to oranges. This is what it's kind of like. And while it seems like a big problem, the, the, the solution really here at all sides is quite simple that I've already mentioned is providing quality and source information to our readers with all the perspectives, right? We don't endorse or advocate for any perspective on all sides. We just want to give you all the perspectives so that ultimately you can think for yourself, you can articulate and form your own opinion and participate in our democracy in an educated and informed fashion. Um, since I have this stage, I'd just like to say that, you know, if you guys have any questions about this or like politics in general, if you see me at a class and share anything, please feel free to come and talk to me. Um, my email will be later provided in the slides, and I um, just want to say that on, on this note, I'm going to hand it off to my colleague Samuel to really dive into how we actually create and develop our all stances. Thank you. So we've talked a lot about the ethical framework that we really apply to all stances. I want to talk about how exactly that framework does get applied in the more practical manner of actually writing. So um, all components of an all sides can mostly be bro broken down into two main goals. One, to demystify common issues, and two, to get all sides of an argument. And all, and all stances usually consist of a quick summary of the history of the issue, a glossary of vocabulary, and then a list of the various stances and the arguments that we find that we find come up a lot in that in that issue space. So the reason why we do this is one, we want to contradict manipulative narratives. Um, so we actually talking about this in my politics and public policy class, where a lot of times politics isn't policy isn't decided just by like the rational policy analysis of oh, this would be hopes more efficient or this would be more equitable. It's often decided by emotion, like patriotism or a sense of injustice. Uh, our example was the idea of welfare queens, which really came up in the late 1980s as a way of trying to build opposition to new welfare programs. And the idea here is that people would just stay in welfare for generations and they wouldn't even try to get a job. The problem was that only 20% of people had been on welfare for more than a decade. And of that 20%, they were overwhelmingly of two different groups. One, they already had a job, but that job paid them so little that they couldn't actually live on that wage. And two, they had either physical or mental health problems that prevented them from holding down a job. So we want to move away from these manipulative narratives and we want to focus on giving people more of the facts and more of the policy analysis so that we can break away from this uh, uh, emotional blackmail. Um, we also want to work on providing common context and vocabulary. And this is where like the summary and the vocabulary come in. Because if you ever looked online, you probably found two groups who think that they're really arguing with each other but they've separated themselves off from each other so much that they're not even like using the same words to describe things. The words that they do have in common have been so twisted that they're not even the same thing anymore. And they're just very isolated. So when they do actually come into contact, again, they can't actually communicate effectively with one another and they can't find any common ground that they could have ever potentially had. We also wanna work on combating misinformation now, a lot of misinformation, it has to originate from somewhere, of course, but a lot of misinformation propagates from people who are well-meaning, but they just see something that already agrees with the point that they already agree with. And without thinking too hard about it, they just share that misinformation. So we're trying to work, and also we're trying to work on stopping that cycle of misinformation by addressing it, by actually addressing it and providing the counter arguments to that misinformation. On the second point, on getting all sides of an argument, this is where a lot of our external engagement comes in, and that's uh, where a lot of our actual listing of arguments comes in. We want to focus on breaking down information bubbles. As uh, Andrew mentioned, a lot of the time, uh, other people's thought processes are so alien to us that we can't really think of why somebody would ever disagree with us. So we're working to 
make sure that we have pretty easy to digest reasons for all sides, well, all sides, yeah. <laughs> for all sides of an argument and making sure that people can actually understand why somebody else would come to that conclusion, even if they don't necessarily change their mind about it. We also do kind of want to move away from the idea of political factionalism. Like, it is a somewhat true view that things are separated in terms of like a Democrat side and a Republican side, but it is often very reductionist. And while we've actually been researching for our, all stances, we found that a lot of the times people on the left and people on the right have a lot more common ground and that there's often other divisions that are creating these scenarios. So we want to work on addressing that and moving people away just from saying, oh, they're just saying that because they're Republican. They're just saying that because they're Democrat. And finally, we want to platform different voices because we want people to go with an all stance and not only have a better view of that particular issue, but have more tools and be more equipped to also understand different issues and be more empathetic when other things come up. So those are the main goals of those all stances. And we also, and I also want to talk some about our tools. Um, speaking of our tools, I know that a fair amount of you just recoiled uh, when you saw this logo. And it's definitely like a hot debate, especially in academia, over like what the role of AI is. Does AI even have a role in, in both education and research itself? Um, so all stances was built with artificial intelligence very much in mind. So we also had to wrestle with the idea of having to use AI ethically. And I think that we've come up with a really good system for doing that. And basically that system is, we just use it as a very basic research tool, but we always make sure that we always go back and we always like properly credit the people who originally came up with that, e that idea in the first place. So generally, the AI is really good at if you don't really know where to start on an issue or you want to emotionally distance yourself away from an issue that you like, maybe you're really passionate about it on your off time, but you want to focus on kind of withdrawing your bias a little bit on that issue. It's really good at giving you that first initial start. Another thing it's really good at is while you're doing your research, it can often give you like the most popular articles, the things that like the advocates are using, the kind of all the kind of research that's coming up in kitchen table conversations. And finally, after we after we finish most of an all stance and we're actually working on getting it edited, it's really great at kind of pulling us back to the big picture because I feel like often, and I run into this with my own school work too. I get very focused on one particular part of the issue. And once again, this kind of pulls me back and makes me focus on actually focusing on the, the rest of that issue. And what we don't do is one, we don't believe the AI without proper verification because sometimes like the way that these current AI tools work, they can just lie. So you want to always make sure that there's another source that's actually backing it up and that that source itself is reputable. On a related note, uh, we don't ever want to use information without first finding and citing the person who actually said it. And what I mean by that is that when the AI generates something, it got it from somewhere. So instead of just saying, oh, this is from ChatGPT, like we don't know where it actually got that. Uh, it's our job, in fact, to go back and find the person who said that and make sure that they're properly credited. And that's also another good vetting procedure because we can also catalog like the potential biases while we're doing that. So with all that in mind, here's a general process. So first we're going to find and evaluate a topic. We're gonna to focus on uh, firstly, um, what issues are like salient to the political situation. And we generally want issues that the average person is going to find important for economic reasons, for legal reasons, for political reasons, because that's just where we do the most like that's where we do the most good like when these conversations are happening especially since these conversations are usually going to be the ones with the most amount of misinformation because there might be a lot of new novel research those issues are probably going to be like confusing to people who have invested a lot of time and we want to make sure that all sides is doing the best it can to provide like to be able to combat misinformation as it forms rather than having to address misinformation years after it's already caused so much damage. So after that, we're going to do our research. And as I mentioned before, we're, we're really sure that 
We want to really make sure that we're balancing out that AI output with actual guided research. We never want to be in a position where we're just looking at the AI and it's giving us something and we have no idea how to evaluate it. So we want to have our own manual understanding of the issue outside of artificial intelligence. We also want to find the issues advocacy groups because those are going to be the groups, one with the most stake in the issue, and therefore probably the ones that we want to give the most platform to. And two, they're going to be the people who can most influence like the legislative policy and the culture around these issues. So after that, um, we're probably going to have pages of like narratives and data and all of this stuff. And we have to and we have to kind of break that down into a un, into an unconnected set of facts into something that can from that can be told basically to our audience and our readers and people who might not necessarily have prior experience with that issue. And after that, we're going to communicate our arguments in an unbiased way, of course. And I don't mean necessarily like we're going to scrub the arguments themselves of all bias. But I feel like people, when they hear an argument that they don't personally agree with, their first instinct is to try to either frame it as badly as possible and make sure like other people don't agree with it, or it's to call into doubt the other person's like good faith efforts. And we, and we particularly want to avoid being the arbiters of truth who say, oh, this isn't a valid argument, or oh, you don't mean that. So we're usually trying to take those arguments at face value. And finally, I think this is our most, the most important step, actually, a reviewing of our work and listening to feedback. So I always have my ideological opposite review my work. In that case, it would be Andrew over here. But um, we're just going to try to make sure, because if both of us agree on like a certain set of facts, we can be pretty sure that those facts aren't the most like aren't having any unnecessarily slant or editor editorializing unnecessarily. When we disagree, that's when we want to think about going back to the drawing board or rephrasing things. And finally, we want to respond to the community. And I think that's really important because we want these to be living documents. We don't want these to be like, we published them one time, they got some views in a week, and then we didn't really talk about them again. We want people to be able to keep going back to these as, of course, the history changes, as new things develop. But also as people who aren't us see these articles and they think, oh, this is an argument that I think would be really good here. Uh, oh, I think that this piece of context like really helps bring this bring this issue together. So uh, hope is that the all sites community can read these and over time we can build even better documents than what we've worked on because we are only three college students. Like we do a lot of research and we have a great editorial team behind us. But ultimately, there are people who have very different experiences and different lives than us, and we want to make sure that they're properly represented in these all stances. So on the and on the topic of public engagement, I'm now going to pass it over to my friend and colleague, Divya. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. I'd like to first start by talking about what we've published so far. As of now, our four all stances include, should GMOs be regulated? Should abortion be regulated? Should we ban assault weapons? And should Supreme Court justices have term limits? Now moving on to my role in this project, I'd like to start talking about how All Sides interacts with its audience. Firstly, we use surveys to interact with our users um, these will be included on every All Stances article that will be published. It increases user engagement to ensure all stances of a topic are accurately covered. Through this project, I've had the opportunity to work alongside bias research manager and data journalist Andrew Weinzero at All Sides to learn the proper questions to ask while creating surveys and to get the best feedback that we possibly can. We ask feedback on individual stances as well as entire articles. So as you can see in the first photo, um, we ask for our audience members to respond to the article as a whole, as well as how much they've learned from each stance. 
We use this data in order to update stances as well as create stances, because as Samuel said, these are living documents that will be, continue to be added to. So we asked if we missed anything in said all stances and for our audience members to go into detail to provide us with more feedback, as well as how we can move forward in improving our work. Alongside with surveys, we like to use social media to promote our work. This is done for every single All Stances article that is posted um, and provides audience with different ways to engage with our information. I've been given the opportunity to work with content designer Joseph Ratliff at All Sides in order to brainstorm ideas and get um, our work posted on the Instagram page. All Sides as a whole provides three types of different content on their social media, whether that be headline roundups where we're able to gain information from different news sources from the left, right, and center, balanced news carousels, which provide stories from left, right, and center as well, along with All Sides Live, which are video format interviews that are hosted through All Sides. Now moving into the All Stances portion of social media, we have been utilizing posts in order to provide readers with core arguments of each stance in order to engage our audience in a different way. As Stories are also posted in this format and they just last 24 hours. Along with posts, we like to use videos. I've been working on developing Instagram reels for this project in order to provide our audience with definitions of key terms as well as a summary of each stance's core argument in order to once again, engage our audience in a different way and provide our readers with a different way to engage with our content. Lastly, kind of tying it all together, social media and media bias, filter bubbles. Social media can be seen as skewed depending on who you all decide to follow and interact with on a daily basis. So filter bubbles can form through that and um, especially as information may not, that does not necessarily align with our views, tends to be harder to digest. So in order to combat this, All Sides provides coverage of current events from different perspectives in order to provide consumers with unbiased knowledge. By following All Sides, you're able to get easy, readable formats of um, information on your phone. And lastly, moving forward, our goals for this project are to further utilize AI in order to build our articles, as well as continue our work of making common ground and providing transparent information to our users. I'd like to further um, engage our audience through surveys, as well as expand our usage of social media. And lastly, expand the All Sides community that reads our articles. I would like to thank everyone once again for being here tonight, spending your time with us today on a Thursday. If you do have any questions for us, feel free to contact us. Our information is up here and Henry's information is also provided. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna pass the mic back to Miriam to host our Q&A portion of the night. Thank you. <laughs> thank you again, Divya. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Sam. Thank you to the audience for being here and supporting our students. Um, at this point, we're going to move on to the Q&A section. Um, I just want to remind everybody in the audience, if you could please uh, voice your questions into the middle mic, just so everybody on Zoom can hear. Um, and for those joining via Zoom, if you haven't already, please type your questions into the Q&A. Um, and then one of our two ambassadors, either Matthew Dehara or Colin Donahue, will go ahead and pose those questions for you. So let's begin. Do we have any questions? Yeah. Oh, if you could go ahead and go to the middle mic, please. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Well, this question is for me. Okay. So in your research, I see that you guys um, you know, said a lot about bias, the bias that we have, and being able to consider multiple perspectives about research. But do you think there's any point 
when you found a, a concept or an idea where they can't possibly be two sides to it because any side, any other side to it would be not the truth or not reality. So was, was there any part of the research where you guys found a, a notion, idea, or perspective where there was just one side? Thank you. Oh, so. Oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, it's okay. Oh, go Thanks, man. Somebody has to go. Sorry, I don't need like fifteen days to answer. Yeah, I just feel most of this stuff the most and. To answer your question, this is one of the reasons I love working for all signs because every day that I step into work, I challenge my bias every day. Right? I try to rest from being partial. And I think to answer your question, did you did you ever run into a scenario with only one side or not bias? Is that right? I think I get the nature of your question, and I think it's also it kind of goes back to media bubbles. And what media bubbles do really well is they have this kind of cookie cutter approach in putting people in the box, right? If you're if you believe this, like this is what you believe, and this is what we talk about, and there's no other solution. This is this is what you believe, this is your stance. And for my work, I've actually noticed that Americans actually have a lot of consensus on a lot of issues. We can find consensus, we can have conversations, we can you know, escape our biases, but I don't think like, well, our media levels and the people that give us information just don't want us to do that. Um, so to answer your question, I haven't personally experienced that. Um, does it exist possibly? And if it does, I mean, I'll let you know, but I, I don't foresee that because I really foresee a future, especially on um, all sides, or for the future, where we have this real conversation, we break down these social bubbles, we can find consensus, and we can work on our democracy. There's not just one side manipulating things like that, but that's, you know, you're, you're definitely bringing up a very good issue, and we're constantly working on trying to fix it. So, thank you a lot for your question. Well, Don, would you like to add anything? Yes, sir. Um, I thought I would answer the case or the case or they're doing, which is not a problem because they're, they're actually looking at issues that are controversial. So the issues that are research and almost are on the sides. That problem could potentially come up with how news is now written. Let's say the news were broke and some of it had like one respect is just outside of sanity or false. Um, we actually don't learn that very often because uh, because we basically look at how news is being covered across the nation by major news sources. So there's a concept of open and overton window. Do you have it? Do, do you know that phrase, overton window? The idea is that there are fringe ideas outside of that, um, but there's a, a large mass of so the idea of genocide or that Jews should be destroyed or that racism is somehow a good thing, whatever. These are things that are outside of the overton window. Um, and so fortunately. The, the media that we're covering across the country is look for it. Don't take those stances. Um, we're, we're not covering everything that anybody says on Twitter. Uh, we're covering what the media covers. So that's not a problem of practicality. And it could be in theoretically, but in reality, we just haven't had it. So I, I made the question harder than that. <laughs> Thank you for that. That's okay. And we do have a question from Henry. So I'm going to mute and let you go ahead and speak to us, Henry. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I just was saying that uh, if uh, if you can direct questions to me, if you want to, I'm here to answer them. But that was all. I didn't have anything specific to bring up. I, since I'm here, I'll say that uh, Sam, Andrew, and Divya did an excellent job with that presentation. I haven't seen it until now. So that was great. And Samuel, uh, he accidentally said all sides when he was talking about all sides, uh, which I can say happens often because we are trying to cover all sides. So. Uh, but yeah, I'm available for help with the Q&A if you need me. That was it.
Thank you for that. So we can also have questions for Henry and we can move on if there are any questions. Hi, um, my question was regarding the use of AI. And I wanted to know how you are sanitizing your inputs for these new generators, which, because when you're concerned about avoiding bias, the core problem that I would see with using AI in that is the training data that has a lot of inherent bias based on both how you phrase the question and the funds embedded to the uh, generating system. Thank you. In terms of that, so firstly, I'm not really on the tech side of models that we use. I don't really have to know anything about like sanitization itself. Yeah, yeah. But on the oh, sorry, I'll but on the second side, like once again, we're not just using the AI as in the black box where we put it in, we get something out and post it on the page. We're also so one always checking like what AI gives us back stuff. And two, we're also doing a lot of manual research on our own. And when we find like novel arguments that the AI hasn't found itself yet, that also makes it into the all stands. We're hoping at some point that the AI gets good enough that like we are sanitizing, I mean, well, all that jobs become the uh, sanitization problem. You mentioned that really well, actually. We're not worried about sanitizing again because we're not relying on It's more like one of many inputs at this point. Um, but I told over time, we know our things you can maybe do is you can create a lot of props for the AI to you know the AI data set is there misleading and, and biased itself. But you can still go to buy sets and what are the different perspectives, what can be the different perspectives. We only it may not be purpose at all, but if you get a big research tool for this team to see things they may not have notice. But then they do the hard work making sure it's good. So as long as you don't believe AI, it's okay to use, but it's a tool to use as part of the process. Now that's the last one. Thank you. And we do have a question from Zoom. Hello, uh, this question is from Jackie Sosa. First, they wanted to comment that the MC Miriam is doing a good job. She's very loud and clear. Thank um, you. <laughs> second, uh, they want to ask Sam, how did you get involved in public policy? <laughs> I mean, there were a lot of factors that went into it. Um, one part of it was that I mean, when stuff was saying, well, like, especially in high school, I started to want to focus on my local community. And I found that public policy was a really good way of kind of skipping like more polarized kind of national situations and focusing more on like what I can do to actually improve the lives of like my local communities and the people around me. Thank you. Any more questions? Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. My name is Pratika. I'm currently an undergraduate here at UC Riverside. I really did enjoy the research design you presented today, as well as the very model that you're building all sides off of. We just did a quick Google search of the Azure website um, to be very comprehensive. Um, but I'm here today because I'm actually here for the class digital government. And we're, we're, what we're learning about is um, using the use of social media and government. Um, so I know you guys probably know a lot about that as well, but one of the questions that I had that really irked me was what Andrew said about um, we're all confidently ignorant. Um, I totally understand that. I feel that a lot of the younger generation as we um, sort of engage with social media and learning a lot of our politics from media itself, um, what would you have to say about um, algorithm use um, within politics and in digital media? Was there a consideration of the technological impact of the algorithms on the different media you're exposed to? Thank you for the question. Excellent question. And also, like you know, thing I said, we're commonly ignorant. That's just something I actually think about John from what he said today. I thought it was absolutely astounding. So I don't want to take credit for that. 
But I'm just, I'm just, your question is a very difficult question to answer. And it's because I don't really spend too much time thinking of art and technology. I'm pretty much just a human that curates it and makes it comprehensive while like three has three. However, if just some things I can notice just by using it is that it, it can straight up just, it can straight up lie, right? It, 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 can, it can give us information. And that's because that's obviously the AI is based off of the internet or something internet, which is probably true as well. And um, while that we're not directly involved in trying to solve that problem, we always, like, um, when we curate that, we always do not like, you know, use the, um, that bias into our, into our article, right? We use manual research to correct that. We cite the right places for the right people. And it's just because AI says, says something doesn't mean we always use it. Sometimes it's a quite attack, a quite frankly, the opposite. It, it says something that was un, untrue. And sometimes it's like, oh, well, this is like something that's like, and they're that's running online. And like, we use it as an account. Like, we, we, we want to use what the AI said that was wrong as one of the stamps, right? As like, well, did, did that only make sense? I hope that answers your question. Uh, if I follow up, feel free. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one more question. So, Hi, uh, sorry. So, among during the presentation, it was discussed that AI is just one tool you guys use to curate uh, sources of information that you can later fact check on, you know, in the in the, in the process. Which it sounds like, first of all, the whole process of going through each information, then sourcing it, signing it, uh, making sure it's from a credible source. I I understand that it's got to be incredibly tedious. And many times that is just it, it, it's no different than just going online, going to each individual source by itself, and just doing the same thing. Which is essentially all AI is just doing, just gathering all sorts of one place for you. So you just go back from that one source, which I, I feel it does save some you know, the time and effort. But at the end of the day, there's still some person at the end who's doing all the fact checking, the resource checking. Are you guys moving towards a goal where AI will do that eventually, or do you guys always go you know, is the manpower needed to do that always to be there? And if it is, how do you make sure that the person behind the fact checking is as unbiased as possible? Well, thank you for your question. I think it's important to know that we have a team of um, writers who will end up editing stamps. So we start with AI. And the goal is to get to the point where we can rely heavily on the AI. But I think it's important to also note that people will always be involved in this project because we have to fact check that information. Um, so it won't be one person. There are three of us and an entire team at all times. So that's the fact check. Okay. I hope that answers your question. I don't feel like you know, the CEO of John might give you a better, you know, projection on it, but we yeah, actually kind of did this like the, eventually, you know, we want AI to have more of a productive and more of a role, but right? obviously you're always gonna need that human curation of the source and things like that. And you know, AI is really precedent. We this has been a pretty novel thing, so we don't know what the what the future holds for it. But I do, I do foresee that there's always going to be like a human being that is like more than a for it if it's published on a couple of websites. I'll add a little bit. I think that you can answer your most of it. That what I think as long as artificial intelligence is going to be black box, and I, like, for example, I can't just look at like the chat and go and be like, oh, that's why it's going to be I don't think it's ever going to get a point where it can be like, Fully automated, and I think that a lot of my, a lot of like, well, like fact checking and verifying and adding this is both like, is both like both product sake and also for the artificial intelligence sake, so that we can see what it's being drawn and why it's being drawn. Is there particular bias? Is there like this particular topic that that's messing up? And so I think that our work is pretty invaluable when it comes to really getting us to that point where things are maybe more automated. Do you want to add something else? I can if you like. I mean, you're all good. 
The question is, how do you want to use AI? And one thing that makes this not a media company, as we've always for me, I mean, we are attended at all sides technologies. It is we want to use it to empower the person to decide for themselves. That's a very different thing than um, most media or most tech people who write textbooks are often to kind of give you what you should think. And we're, we have a very different fundamental idea of our role in this. And as a result, we use AI differently. We use um, how we write books differently. The way we use technology is different. Can we get to the point where somebody can type in an issue? And not AI by itself, but our other technologies as well, be able to provide you four or five different stances on that. I think we might be able to get to that. Um, but I but we have to be very, very careful about it. And there are more ways to verify that that works. And here's also an email. I absolutely agree with that. And that can be done also with crowd wisdom or uh, different balanced groups of people interacting. I can imagine a group of, of, of growing people like this online um, volunteering their expertise. So thinking about what if you get to have some things are good, some things are bad. This room is it's bad like our our engine writing which is kind of much. Um, but I also was like somebody who can develop software um, and so if you check in bad code that breaks software. We wouldn't have Linux, which is the most popular Unix-based system. Uh, we wouldn't have a Zilla Firefox, which is written by an open community online. So it's not like just AI all by itself. And it's not just people all by themselves. It's bringing all this together in a new way to be able to get something even better than we have now to enable all of us to understand this. So it's not that people like to learn how to use that tool. And we're really focused on how to use it to empower people as opposed to how we saw them up today where we place people. And that is a very, very fundamental difference in how we see technology. Thank you everyone for all the questions for the to the presenters for answering. Um, I think we have a question from Henry on Zoom. Uh, no, no question. <laughs> Just want to say uh, thanks again and uh... Good job, everyone. We appreciate the questions. And uh, yeah, Andrew, Sam, and Divya, I'll uh, see you guys next week for a regularly scheduled meeting. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thanks, Thanks Andrew. Thank yeah, thank you so much again, Divya and Sam, Henry, and John for being here. Thank you all for supporting your fellow students and colleagues. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions, but the conversation actually doesn't have to stop there. We have boba and mingling. So I encourage you all to boba and mingle. And then I want to encourage all of you to do three things. Well, if you're in public policy, please reach out to myself or one of your other fellow ambassadors for more information on how you can be in your own student spotlight. Two, please check out our podcast policy chats for more critical and necessary information. Three, please consider the VA MPP program. And last but not least, I think I said three or four things. Um, as Andrew, Divya, and Sam said, best, think for yourselves. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your evening. Oh. Mm -hmm.